I pinky promise you that I will never, ever, ever become that sellout because I love you and I want you guys to value what I say and know that I am being 100% honest with you at all times. To both my new and old subscribers, welcome back, dear viewers. To the random people who just happened to stumble across my channel, welcome to another deep dive. We've recently reached a major milestone here. The Unpoetic Justice channel has recently broke 1,000 subscribers which means celebrations are in order. Back in December, I posted a poll asking you guys, the dear viewers, my poets, if you will, <laughs> to vote on what 1K special you guys would like to have. I didn't think I would reach this milestone until March at the earliest, so I'm scrambling to get it prepared, but I wanted to extend the voting deadline just a few more days to allow new subscribers and watchers to weigh in as well. So remember to subscribe so you guys can catch the new and super long video that will be coming out at some point in time. <laughs> Today we are performing another in-depth analysis on a creator who gained most of her notoriety between the 2016 and 2018 YouTube time space. We are talking about the infamous story time legend, Miss Tana Mojo. Tana of Cancelled with Tana Mojo. Tana of Tana by Tana. Tana of Tana Uncensored. Tana of Trash. Tana of Endless Scandal and Speculation. So without further ado, let's take a dive. The first video to date on Tana's self-titled YouTube channel is Hairdresser from Hell and was posted in May of 2015. During her primary period of growth from 2015 to 2017, Tana's primary video topics were story times along with the occasional vlog here and there. Story time content actually fit Tana's personality quite nicely. It allowed her to ramble, lack both video and story structure, and it gave her an outlet to live out her fantasies of being a wild child. All of this was achieved under the guise of being purely authentic, scatterbrained, and relatable. The perfect way to capture an audience in 2015. At the time of filming and posting, Tana was only 17 years old, and much of her development on YouTube occurred between the ages of 18 and 19, and that fact is very inescapable when you watch her older content. It's 65, like I put my friend's name, you know? And then she was like, oh, it is 65. I'm sorry, honey. Like, I thought you wanted blank. I think she said, like, balayage or whatever. I don't know how to say that. She, like, thought I wanted that. I was like, no, I want to bleach and tone, like, for $65. Her cadence, mannerisms, and mentality all align with that of a teenager and have remained so to this very day. I've been gone for a really long time, and it feels amazing to be back. There's nothing like coming back with a stalker update. Oh, and I came back from my house the other day, and this bathroom window was just wide open. I completely forgot about that until right now. When it wasn't before, because I shut it but I was just watching this clip back and I'm gonna play it for you again and look where I show you. I know this entire video is about me being stalked but how there's a potential haunting. This is significant because with other YouTubers and other online celebrities, as they grow over time, you can observe changes within their content and how they speak to their audiences. Tana is an outlier to this typical model because when you watch a video of hers from 2015 and compare it to one recently published, she is still the exact same girl. But today's video is one that you never wanna make, and that is a stalker update. I don't even know when my last stalker update was, and it's funny because I get tweets like, you just did the stalker story for views, and then like as soon as the views of that were over, like you stopped doing it, and we want an update, and is there no update, and did you lie about it? It's never gonna go away. Also sitting down to just tell this story actually literally stresses me the f out so I need to distract myself by putting some curly mousse in my hair while I talk about the fact that I'm gonna get fucking murdered. So I asked you guys on Twitter today if you wanted to see a stalker like update like the finale to my stalker series or if you wanted to see a back to school haul and I literally don't even think one single person was like yeah I want to see a back to school haul. Every single person was like Tan are you fucking kidding me like what the f do you think we want to see and I was like Shit, I'm so sorry I asked. I'll film a stalker update, and here I am. She sports the same persona that is, messy, farcical, and like any other sorority girl you would see in a B-horror movie or in a romantic comedy. 
I don't quite understand the attraction to such personalities, but I can concede that the content was simply not for me. If you were at all aware of Tana Mojo during her heyday, you may have heard that her storytime content was undeniably unrealistic, over-exaggerated, and just plain dishonest. During these story times, she constantly stated something along the lines of, OMG, nobody's life is like mine, or even perhaps, oh my god, I'm giving you guys so much unnecessary detail to the story. To the former declaration, some people may feel a sense of connection to the self-proclaimed wild child because maybe their lives hold certain similarities so they feel like they're a part of the in crowd with Tana. For the latter statement, however, I usually just clock this as an influencer who has nothing much to say and seemingly acknowledging as much, but also still seeks to be validated by their own audiences. If you drop down to the comment section of any of the videos where she says this in, there's always a plethora of comments telling her how much they love her and her unnecessary details. These are important factors because from the very beginning of analyzing her channel, we must begin pinpointing the markers as to why so many people are drawn to this then child. And Speaking of childlike, we do need to acknowledge the over-sexualization of some of her early videos. Every time I ran across a thumbnail or video title about her alleged sexual escapades, about her body, anything that played off of the hot blonde bimbo stereotype, I internally cringed and felt very uncomfortable. These types of videos started to be sprinkled in on her channel around July of 2015 and onwards. Clickbaiting was at an all-time high during 2015 on YouTube, but her channel was at a level that I've rarely seen. For example, her vlog Getting Wet in San Diego was just a standard average vlog that was frankly very boring, but it was just about a bunch of teenagers going to the beach. There was and is an audience for that type of content, so why the intentionally sexualized title? Did she think it was funny? Or was she intentionally sexualizing herself, a young teenager, to reel in a, a certain type of audience member? And if the latter is true, we would need to examine the why and the implications, but more on that later. I actually just scrolled through this long ass script that I have here and realized that I didn't formally add a section about it. So we're actually gonna go ahead and talk about it right now, just going based off my notes. Modern day Tana Mojo is a very sexually expressive being and an OnlyFans star. And that's all fine and dandy. She's a grown woman and I support bodily autonomy and willful sex work. I may even directly support it sometimes. And I will also never tell a young adult that it is their sole responsibility to jade their sexuality and explicit lifestyles because they have an underage fan base to some extent. This is not the Disney Channel. We do not advocate for the dictation of someone's life because they may not be kid friendly. I firmly believe that parents need to know who, what, and why their children are watching. We're playing Never Have I Ever on stage. And so then I'm like, I'll take a few Never Have I Ever's from the audience. Someone in the audience asks, Never Have I Ever Done Anal? First of all, there's like nothing wrong with that. I go back to answer it and then I see a mom in the back of the crowd who for the last like 20 minutes of the show was like waving, like trying to get my attention and I was kind of just brushing it off. I thought she just had like a question or something. And so finally I look at her and she looks at me and she's like, do you f***ing know how old these kids are? I look at her and I know that she's angry. So I say something along the lines of, yeah, but like, did you watch my videos before you bought the ticket for your 13 year old kid? And so then the entire audience starts cheering, kind of booing her and stuff like that, which I'm not condoning. Like I'm not sitting here saying like, boo this lady. I mean, so did you watch my videos before you bought the ticket for your kid? <laughs> Needless to say, I would not allow my very young child to watch YouTube or TikTok. These influencers, Tana Mojo, the D'Amelio sisters, Meredith Duxbury, whomever or whatever, problematic or not, they are not role models for young children or at least they shouldn't be. Will they be seen as role models despite our wishes and their own? Yes. Yes, absolutely yes. But the issue with role models in general is elevating a person to a degree of perfection that no one can achieve. And they cannot achieve it not necessarily because they are not a good person, but because no one person can satisfy the expectations of everybody. Despite popular belief, there is no such thing as concrete morality or a set of ethics that we all collectively believe in. The ethics and moral principles found in Catholicism profoundly differ from those that exist in Wicca or Shinto 
Shintoism. What we can do is admire specific actions and characteristics of someone, even an influencer, but we still should not hold them to the traditional expectations of a role model. We have to find balance when it comes to public figures and their effects on the youthful. And most of the time, the responsibility is going to rest on the parents' shoulders. Because as guardians and caretakers, it is our jobs to guide our children through the mess that is life and help them understand that people are just that people. No person belongs on a pedestal. But I still want to analyze this then child's proclivity to sexualize herself. <laughs> this is something that is not unique to Tana. This is a behavior that is commonly found in teenage girls due to social pressures, referring to both the push for teens to remain pure and the alternative push for teens to feel more comfortable in having sex and engaging in the casual sex or casual dating scenes. Young girls may sometimes feel like sexualizing themselves is a form of rebellion, a way to defend feed and deflect the puritanical teachings that were pushed onto them. Alternatively, some may do so as a way to gain validity and recognition because Western society has regular told, and in some tragic cases shown us, that a girl's only worth is her beauty and her body. Additionally, Tana was someone in the same place as some Hollywood child stars were in. She was surrounded by adults in the industry, adults that she previously looked up to and idolized. At one point on the cancelled podcast, she claimed to have been used by certain influencers for both sexual and monetary gains. <laughs> and that's not right. That's not correct. I know now I was 17 at the time, 18. Like, that's not what you do. But at the time, it was just like, oh, you think I'm this and you're treating me and calling me all these names and treating me really horribly and like using me for a lot of money. And like, if you're going to say I'm cheating. OK, I'm going to cheat. And it's like if you're using me for mad money and making me buy hella shit for you and like you know, forcing me to fly out to you just to be like super emotionally and like psychotically abusive, like, okay, bet. And so I started kind of hooking up with other people. Shout out JC Kalen, shout out Cody Co. Don't. No. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> and, and I did want to point out one thing about this particular instance. Girl, why didn't you point to Shane Dawson? This is your king, right? When Shane and I met, I was 17 and it was just like a thing, like every single thing he this said This sounds to me. like the start of a really scary <laughs> Tumblr post and I don't like it. Said, like if you said something in front of me that was like sexual, you'd be like, right. she's 17. We were going to watch horse porn and you were like, oh my right. God, she's 17. Right. It was just like a struggle, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. This man. I have a list of things that I want you to do now that you're 18. He never tells me that like he's prepared and it's just always like, okay. Well, first things first, I think like the initiation process should okay. be for you to see me naked. Um, a scenario or like something that you're into. What are you into? Oh my God, what's that one where the guy's is just like gaping? Uh, they're called rosebuds. Prolapse, prolapse anus. Like yeah, I just want to see like 10 dicks in one. Oh, oh, that's different. Okay. Okay. This grown ass man who approved and encouraged you to post this video when you were only 18 years old. We should do it. Can I piss on you? Yes. Do you want to? Shit, I will piss on you. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can't if you want. I, will, I need water. Give me water. I'm going to piss all over you. <laughs> I literally swear to 18. Well, what we could do to get the flag is you can just like straddle me and pee on my lap, and then I'll show them the pee. <laughs> and then this video, not even a few months later. Okay. Okay. It wasn't as close as I was for years with Shane Dawson. And the other night we had a really good conversation and that made me happy. I felt like a lot of things were cleared up and I was just overthinking everything and yeah. felt good. And, you know, I'm, I can resolve things for sure. I, I like doing that if it's resolvable. Sometimes people just do things that are too far, you know? So you guys are cool now, you and Shane? Yeah. Can make another documentary? I, honestly, I hope he does. I know Tana lacks integrity and believability for a number of reasons, but the evidence of young girls being used in the entertainment and social media industries does not just come from her. There's a long history to it, and I wouldn't be surprised if Tana experienced some of the remnants of it. And it is something to keep in mind as we dredge through the rest of her online career. The video series that skyrocketed Tana to being on more people's radars and was more than likely the inspiration behind several other storytime channels was her stalker series. And it is still insane to me that this became a trope of story 
daytime creators during that time. Even from the very start of her channel, and I'm sure some videos have been long since privated or removed, but in the span of a year, she created two videos about reading hate comments and has offhandedly mentioned the hate that she received under several other videos. At the time of posting, she had 90,000 subscribers and she lamented on the amount of hate comments she started to collect. The comments she exemplifies are things that I would most certainly categorize as hate as well. People left the nastiest comments in 2015 or 2016 and she always had such a benevolent way of addressing the most important parts of these comments. This racial slur loving is a skank. Your face looks like a foot. <laughs> Does my face really look like a f***ing foot? That's a really good hate comment. To be honest with you, if I was like a weak hearted I would probably walk around for the next week being like, my face looks like a foot. One of the core purposes of this video is to examine why and how Tana rose to fame. And to do that, we need to understand how some of her actions in her early content can tell a retroactive story of her. Meaning we need to denote the precursors that led her to becoming the controversial figure that she is today. There were so many telltale signs of the woman that she would become scattered throughout her videos that are not even related to controversies. In her early content, the consistencies I noted are as follows. Seeking validation from her audience members while trying to hold on to an unbothered persona, a lack of true authenticity, a balanced duality between relatability and being life goals, vanity and confusion, as well as overcompensation. But how do we distinguish which characteristics were simply incidental to her being a teenager at the time and what is actually indicative of Tana the person, or rather Tana the YouTube persona? Elementary, my dear Watson. We observe patterns in her older content where she is clearly donning an over-exaggerated persona and see if it compares to videos where this persona is dropped in the same period of time. And then we can compare it to her present content. I feel like this video is an important mask off moment for Tana in her early career. It is not a scandal, nor is it a scam. Just Tana defending herself and calling someone out for shaming others for not being vegan. Today's video is gonna be a little bit of a long one. So so yes, Freely, you're going to have to split up your reactions to this in a few parts in order to get more views. I'm so sorry. And a little bit of a controversial one. I had a lot of people tell me that I shouldn't make this video, but I thought that if I made it in the right way and I really clarified, I clarified any negative stipulations that people may have, that I could get my point across in the correct way. Her chaotic energy is significantly decreased, and when she tries to elevate it, normally in editing, it seems artificial and forced. However, when we bored slash binge eat, when we eat junk food that isn't good for us when we're not hungry, our brain releases an opioid, which is a chemical that makes us feel good and feel happy. That's often why when you're eating like delicious chocolate cake, you feel really happy. Another thing that was like funny to me about one of Freely's little things that she does is that in her first video about me, she made sure to pronounce my name totally correct, Tana, you know, whatever. And in her second video about me, when she already filmed another video about me pronouncing my name correctly, she kept calling me Hannah like she didn't know my name quick side note i'm not saying like she didn't know my name like i think i'm so relevant that everybody like has to know my name if anything i'm the exact opposite of that i'm an irrelevant piece of shit. i meant that in the sense of the fact that she's watched several of my videos obviously due to her three reaction videos to them i start my videos off by saying hey guys it's tana mojo like that's just kind of like an insult so freely is known for using really really misleading titles about other YouTubers, other celebrities in order to get views about her videos in a negative fashion. And I'm not gonna lie, I'm not the type of person who respects other people that use negative titles about other people in their YouTube videos in order to gain success or views. We're all here because we worked really hard on our videos in order to gain and gain a following. We didn't just use everybody else's name in a terrible up way as a cheat code you know are you okay with knowing the fact that the only reason why you get subscribers and views is bullying other people and i know to that freely is going to come on here and say oh well i only use the names of other people so that i can get recognition about the torture to animals and the torture to animals is much worse than me defaming and hurting other people's names well freely 
You are right about that. Hurting animals is terrible and everyone should be vegan. That's why I'm vegan. But does that make it okay? Where in your world do two wrongs make a right? Just because that person is doing something wrong, why do you have to come on and call them fat and say they eat periods and say they suck tea? and say they're disgusting. This gave me an indication that she felt insecure about making points that she truly believed in. It can be very intimidating for anyone to step up to the plate and state your own opinion with your whole chest with no persona. Because now when people attack you or your beliefs, they are coming for you. Your persona is no longer acting as a protective shield or barrier. Something else that is very noticeable in this particular video is Tana's lack of understanding the power of her platform. Speaking of me being a 12 year old. Another thing that was really weird is in one of her videos, Freely talked about one of my videos called I Got Banged with a Toothbrush. You may have seen it, shameless self promo. Check it out. Her boyfriend suddenly, when was something was talking about me getting fucked, got interested because he's creepy <laughs> and was like, Oh, what's that about? And Freely was like, Oh, it's a video where she talks about a guy spreading a rumor about her getting banged with a toothbrush. And he goes, Oh, I'd love to see a live link of that. Send me that. Would you love to see a live link of me, a 17 year old, getting with a toothbrush? You're not creepy. You're not weird. She criticizes Freely's husband for allegedly wanting a clip of Tana getting banged by a toothbrush, which is a reference to a very infamous story time video that was 100% clickbait and was just about an ex starting a rumor about her. Tana didn't understand how she, a then teenager, posting a video about herself with that type of title could result in predatory actions and behaviors being levied against her. This is why I'm pretty against underage kids and even teenagers having platforms like Tana's that are built on stories about their lives and sexual histories. How could you possibly understand the ramifications of that kind of content at that age? The confused nature of Tana's content is exemplified by videos where she constantly insinuated that she, in 2016, no longer drank or partied. But she has a ton of stories from when she was in the 8th and 9th grades where she did. She tried to play it off like she was no longer into those childish shenanigans, but was still more than comfortable speaking to her audience about them in a way that would glorify her past actions. Today's video is one that I'm a little bit like stupidly excited to film because the story is really interesting and I've been kind of waiting until the right time to make stories about things like this because I didn't want it to come off in the wrong way but lately people have just been finding a lot of my old tweets from me in like eighth or ninth grade where I thought it was so cool to like drink and get so drunk and like party and it's like funny because I feel like people think that it's like a secret and it's like not a secret I've just never made videos about them. So today's video is going to be the story of the first time I ever drank alcohol. But before I start the video, I just want to say a few things. Now I never drink to get drunk. I think being sloppily drunk, I think falling over drunk, I think throwing up, I think being incoherent, not being able to control yourself is absolutely disgusting and that is not who I am at all now anymore. In this story time, she constantly contradicts herself. I don't advocate for underage drinking, but I still do it, but I don't do it to get drunk. I do not advocate for underage drinking at all in any way, shape or form, but if you're going to do it, <laughs> don't drive, don't take drinks from people you don't know, don't let people make your drinks for you. You don't. Again, this is a child's logic because we all know teenagers and children don't listen to those types of disclaimers. She should know that since she was one. <laughs> The confusion about persona for her is shown to me by her desire to be so real and wanting to be so open, but also knowing that these attributes that she talks about, most people would not look very favorably upon them. So again, I am left to speculate that she dreaded public hostility, no matter how often she tried to present as unbothered. And she was certainly uncertain about her own reality online at that time. And again, these characteristics of fear and confusion is not unique to Tana. It is something that is very observable throughout Gen Z, Gen Alpha, as well as younger millennials. The predominant marker of the millennial generation and what sets them apart from their predecessors Gen X and their successors Gen Z, aside from 9-11, is their interaction with technology and the internet. According to the Pew Research Center, while Gen X grew up as the computer revolution was taking hold, millennials came of age during the internet explosion. Gen X were the leaders of this technological expansion and boom, and millennials were the unassuming recipients. As millennials came of age, they were adapting and learning about this newfangled accessible thing called the internet. Millennials did not have
have any expectations for the internet, its uses, or its purpose. It was not yet the sole place of residence for community and social interaction. It was simply incidental. Most millennials can remember the shifts from dial-up to Wi-Fi, pagers to cell phones, cell phones to smartphones, and so on and so forth. And they can remember it all with a point of reference to what their childhoods were like prior to these technological tools. In other terms, millennials grew up alongside the internet, meaning while the internet was developing and growing, so were millennials. Opposingly, most of Gen Z grew up with the internet. The distinction here is that many in Gen Z starting in 1997 remembers their childhoods with the internet as the focal or central point. The interactions millennials had online as children and young teenagers were probably mainly random game sites like Girls Go Games or whatever website the Impossible Quiz was on. It was meant for fun or for schoolwork, not quite yet a thing for social interactions. Gen Z's interactions are characterized by social media and entertainment platforms like YouTube. But most notably, unlike millennials, they were not often bound to the family desktop computer in the living room. Gen Z are known as digital natives for a reason. Their ability to quickly grasp onto technology was unprecedented. More than ever in the late 2000s and early 2010s, young kids and teens had an access to a variety of websites and forums, including but not limited to instant messaging platforms, blogging sites like Tumblr, pornography, endless access to escapism to avoid the struggles in their offline lives. Gen Z's online interface, how much time they spend online, how much effort they put into building their online profiles and personas, how young they were when they were introduced to it all, all correspond with the growth of Tana's YouTube channel. Had she not been introduced to the possibility of creating a platform that could lead her to online fame so young, she would probably not be where she is today. Tana would look very different had she been a millennial. In her early content, the I don't care attitude is not simply contrived because she was a lying twit or anything of that nature. It was contrived because she subconsciously learned how to perform by watching others build similar platforms. The reacting to hate comments or reading hate comments video type was so common in the time during her rise. People acted as if the hate did not bother them or like they did not care. I would argue that these were all mostly performances for a number of reasons beginning with the fact that the average person rarely had to deal with a large amount of hate on or offline prior to the dawn of content creators so the average person would not have any tools to deal with such a large amount of antipathetical feedback and criticism. Most people would become overwhelmed, maybe even fearful if you can remember the types of things people used to say more freely online. Regardless, aside from her extremely jaded persona, Tana may have been radicalized by the amount of hate she received in her early career. And I'm not referring to radical politics here. <laughs> As said by a conceptual analysis article titled Psychological Mechanisms Involved in Radicalization and Extremism, from a functional point of view, radicalization is defined as an enhanced preparation for intergroup conflict and an accentuated engagement to it. From a descriptive standpoint, radicalization refers to a change in beliefs, feelings, and behaviors that justify intergroup violence and the demand for sacrifice in defending the own group. The latter half is a bit dramatic for our purposes, but just keep it in mind as we go along. Hate comments and her unaware awareness, or rather really our collective unawareness, of the effects of being online so frequently and being so heavily followed as a teenager could have affected her outlook on life, could have radicalized Tana in the sense that she decided to lean more into the discourse, decided to lean more into the crass and uncouth behaviors to lean more into the deception. Many creators have speculated that Tana became less concerned with keeping her channel family friendly and less enamored with the idea of being a role model and in favor of divorcing herself from all expectations. Other YouTubers have said that at some point, Tana wanted people to view her as a mess, as someone you should have no expectations of. And while that theory is well and fine, it gives Tana way too much credit. I don't think she was very conscious of that shift. Back in 2015, Tana was very on board with the idea of wanting to be a role model and, and wanting to positively impact kids that were younger than her, which is ironic given her content style. I definitely over the last couple months have realized how much impact I have, even though it is small in the sense of the world, it is big in the sense of the lives that I can change and help, you know? And today I woke up with a burning desire to use that for something other than cussing and complaining. And I miss the days when I 
only would get a couple messages and I could reply to every single one of them and give you guys advice. Whether modern day Tana simply lost hope in resurrecting her credibility or she just no longer cares at all is almost irrelevant because she has been shown that she can have success and fame without giving much regard to her fan base or her impact. <laughs> The most notable thing about Tana is her controversies. How varied they are, how frequent they were and are, and how performative and lackluster her apologies have been. We will be dissecting most of her major controversies, from inappropriate story times to derogatory and offensive languages to scams and scandals. And from there, we will begin to analyze why people still choose to trust and support her after each instance. The first dedicated apology video on the Tana Mojo channel is titled The truth and an apology. Running for about 15 minutes, it was posted in November of 2015. The video was in reference to a story time she posted a week prior regarding a situation that occurred between herself at the age of 16 and a popular Viner, who I'm suspecting was an adult at the time. I was unable to locate the deleted video, but from what I gathered from both Tana's video and her comment section, is that she told a story in her typical fashion with the, um, with the teenage humor, where she recounts an experience about being sexually harassed by a Viner she used to look up to. She was criticized at the time for the manner in which she told the story as well as accusing the Viner of inappropriate behaviors. The point of this was is that I'm apologizing for the way I told that story. I should not have used certain words so lightly. I should not have made fun of it. I should not have made jokes around it and let everyone else think that it was a joke because it was a really serious situation. and I by telling that story in the wrong way. And just so we're abundantly clear, people made Tana feel as if she needed to apologize for how she chose to discuss an experience where she felt used and harassed. I absolutely abhor that she was made to feel like she did anything wrong given the context. When it comes to discussing experiences like this, we should not impose upon how alleged victims choose to present themselves in tone. She was a young girl processing an experience that hurt her. I understand the concerns of monetizing the experience and showcasing it to her audience as if it were a joke. The latter is the fairest critique, but sometimes we have to run a more extensive cost-benefit analysis on situations like this because of the additional context, because of the sensitivity of the context. I'm sorry for the way I told that story. I am sorry using terms I shouldn't have used. I'm sorry for hinting at the person's name. I'm sorry for exposing them, and I'm sorry for the drama that I've created, and I'm sorry for messing with their success. To watch a young lady apologize for exploiting the person who allegedly victimized her was uncomfortable to say the least. We can have a conversation about the culture surrounding public callouts, but not in relation to these types of allegations. There's so much that goes into them that I feel like any creator would run the risk of blaming a potential victim for their experience, causing additional harm and possibly losing the trust of their followers. A commentator's approach to critiquing a person and sharing their encounters should be almost non-existent. Unless there are very unique, very specific nuances to a situation, I can see no utility in a commentator analyzing a person's recounts. When it comes to essay allegations, it is often not a question of how should we approach the topic in conversation, it should be a question of should we. Should we as creators, as commentators, publicly analyze or deconstruct an alleged victim's testimony? This is a much larger conversation than just Tana herself, obviously, and it is a question I am posing to you guys right now for future discussion. Aside from the fact that this is one of the few times I will say Tana should have never apologized for a damn thing, in this video we learned a few things. One, Tana has been in love with the idea of YouTube since the ages of 11 and 12, which are very impressionable and important developmental years. Years. I have been obsessed with YouTube for as long as I can remember. I have been so obsessed with content creation since I was probably 11 or 12. Two, she wanted to subvert the blonde bimbo stereotype and become someone authentic, someone who does not sell out. I told myself before I started YouTube that I was going to be different and that I wasn't going to be like every other YouTuber and that I wasn't going to be the sellout average blonde bimbo on YouTube. Three, she knows her content doesn't seem to be helpful in any way to others outside from the laughter that she incites. I also told myself that I wanted my YouTube to be a place where I could tell crazy stories from my crazy life 
with the goal to make people laugh and the goal to hopefully help some people. Which I would argue is honestly enough, but creators, particularly story time creators, sometimes have very unrealistic goals for themselves and their content. Tana is not the first story time girly to say that she wants to help others. Nikki Glamour has said the same thing as well as Carrie Dayton during her story time days. This may be because story time channels are often disregarded as valueless channels that offer nothing to the online zeitgeist and because their content styles attract a young viewership, they bear a lot more responsibility when it comes to impacting the youth in the eyes of some. They are often berated for doing so since their content is mostly inappropriate appropriate for a young viewership. And we can argue about who has more responsibility in protecting minors between parents, government agencies, media platforms, and creators. But these story time creators are very much aware of their younger audience, so it can feel very strange and alarming to watch them continuously post videos about sexual escapades and drunken behaviors. Nevertheless, I believe they often want to be more and want to do more, but are unable to pinpoint how to go about it without losing a certain portion of their audience. And number four on our list would be, I believe that this is one of the first times Tana truly felt the weight of the ramifications of her persona, clickbaiting and exaggerating her stories. I feel like so many people have the wrong impression of me now because of the video that I made and think of me differently and think of my intentions differently. and. If that's the case, I at least want to attempt to sit down and make a video telling the truth. I imagine many people pointed to her previous videos to cast doubt onto her for this situation. But of course, she didn't really learn that much from the experience of that backlash because only a month later we get the story time title, I got roofied at a party. This story time was essentially describing a time where a man that she didn't know gave her water with Molly in it without her knowledge. And she finishes out the story by acknowledging that the title was clickbait by stating, For all of you like correction Nazis, I know that being roofied technically means that somebody put a roofie in your drink or like a Xanax in your drink, like something to make you like pass out and like be incoherent so they can like fuck you in all of your holes. I know that, like, that's not what happened to me. Like, I was awake, it was like a different kind of drug, but like, I. An instant like this should make you start to question whether or not Tana was sincere in her original apology. Because although I may not have believed that she should have ever made that particular apology, the acknowledgement that she gave stating that she would never make light of a such a serious topic ever again, and then to turn around and make this video. Hmm. The next topic of discussion we have on our docket is the infamous IDUB situation. Now, I've already made an entire video regarding this event as part of my Content Cop retrospective, but the way I discussed it in that setting was specifically around deconstructing the N-word, its meaning both past and present. I also detailed Ian's arguments for using the N-word and refuted them. I highly recommend that video if you're at all curious about those topics. But what I didn't do is focus on Tana in that video because it wasn't about her. But this one is. As a brief recap, in 2017, Tana called out iDubs on Twitter for his usage of the N-word as well as other derogatory language and in response, Ian made a content cop on her and her hypocrisy since she had previously been called out for using that very same word in an outwardly censorious manner. The content cop video included footage where iDubs ventured to Tana's in-person event and did this. Time, Tana did not know that the culprit was Ian, so as one would, she decided to capitalize off of the experience and create a story time for her fandom. And this is where the gloves are coming off for Miss Mojo because we're going to tear apart this video. If this video was not foreshadowing for all the shenanigans that she would pull in the next five years, I don't know what is. In this video, so appropriately titled The N Word, she opens by reinforcing the parasocial relationship she forged with her audience. Something happened to me this weekend on tour that I just can't shake. I can't get it out of my head. And for me, when I really can't shake something and I really can't get it out of my head, the one thing I want to do is sit down and talk to you guys. But when I'm at just a complete loss at a situation, the people I want to come to is you guys because you guys are my best friends. You guys are my family. You guys know me so well. She made her audience feel special, made them feel needed. She requested for no one to view this video as melodramatic because she was just 
so baffled and hurt by the experience. I hope that people don't look at this as me being melodramatic because this really shook me. She just wanted advice from a friend. Tana told us that while she was worried about her safety, that wasn't the reason why she was making the video. It's because there is a much deeper conversation to be had here. If you're... <laughs> I don't want to turn this situation into a selfish, like, oh, what if I got hurt? Because that's not the point of this video. The point of this video is a way, way bigger picture than even my life. But I don't know, I just, I can't help but think of this situation also in a scary way. If you're aware of the situation, you know that she was publicly dragged for this video several times over for over-dramatizing what actually happened. He walks up to me and he kind of like locks his arm around me, like around my neck like this. And it, it wasn't like it was like a chokehold or anything. It was, it was very like firm and like tight like I couldn't have really gotten out if that makes sense I, I'll explain that in a second and so the guy looks at me and he wraps his arm around me and he looks at the camera and he goes say and puts his thumbs up and then like blank and he says the n word like hard r but that is not what this conversation is about but I will say there is validity in feeling threatened to some extent if someone you thought was a genuine fan did something very unexpected around you yes she's dramatic as all holy hell but I can understand being upset and confused in the moment. What I do want to focus on here are a few key things. Her immediate desire to capitalize on an allegedly traumatizing situation. Emphasis on the allegedly. Her intense need to manufacture the strongest parasocial relationship with her audience possible. Her attempts to elicit feelings of empathy from her audience by constantly reiterating that Ian's actions could have ruined the event because it soured her mood and she's just such an open book that everyone would have been able to read the emotions on her face. Because not only are they like probably also afraid for their lives, probably also afraid for this situation, probably also confusing what's going on. They're seeing me like break down at the fullest extent of breaking down and nothing like hurts me more than breaking down in front of you guys because I always want to be like your big sister and like know what to do in situations and her performative efforts to sympathize with black people. It is very ironic to call others uneducated if they do not believe in the concept of white privilege existing, but to also not truly understand why what Ian did would be considered racist. Before people leave comments about white privilege not being real, if you think that, like I don't want supporters that think that. If you're uneducated, I would love to educate you, but if you are educated and you're like white privilege doesn't exist, you know, fuck all, it, it does. It really Really, really does. A lot of people mistake white privilege for a lot of things. They think that it's like we're like we're treated one way or something or it's like some big thing. It's in reality it's the basis when white people walk around, when they live their day-to-day -day life, when they go to Target, when they go to Walmart, they don't ever have to for one second live in fear of their life or a situation because of their skin color. When white people are approached by police, their first instinct is not, let me put my hands up, because they're not afraid of police. But when African American people are in a situation with police, they don't know if those police are here to help them or to hurt them. I'm sure we can all understand an argument of if a white person is so comfortable with using the N-word so flippantly, maybe they have some issues, maybe they have some unacknowledged prejudices. If we wanted to say that Ian used the N-word so loudly and proudly without giving any kind of regard to the black people who may have been present may speak to his arrogance and racial insensitivity and therefore could also be used as evidence of racist behavior that argument could very well be made that's fair however these are arguments that i would never expect for someone like tana to even think of or make because she does not truly care about the black community as we will see later in the scenario where tana had no context of who this random man was at the time the terms ignorant arrogant obnoxious edgy attention seeking would all have crossed my mind if i were tana racist probably would not be one of them because where were the black people on site <laughs> Where did she see the racist intentions? Tana is not aware of social instabilities or the opinions of black and brown people, so we would really have to try and get into her very surface level understanding of racism to see how she could possibly view the situation as truly racist. To her, it was a white man saying the n-word to a white woman without the term being referenced to anyone in particular. To her, whether the action was actually racist or not did not matter. Explaining how that action could have been perceived as racist 
did not matter. Her only thought was to capitalize. Her only thought was to engage with social justice movements in an attempt to show how she has grown from her past racially driven scandals. In addition to this, she gave us the same line that other influencers always use. I acknowledge my white privilege and I want to use my platform to advocate for equality. I don't want you guys to think that in any way I'm trying to make this video like my spotlight feel bad for me, pity me because like I'm already white privileged enough and I need to be aware of it and I need to use my platform to do everything I can to advocate against that and to advocate for equality. But I'm also going to sit here and give this video an inflammatory title that has nothing to do with me. People's use of the n-word, whether they're white or otherwise, will never affect me. But here I am, I think as if it does, I'm going to preach to you guys about white privilege, how bad Trump is and how saying the n-word is bad. But I'm not going to go out of my way to shout out any organizations to help with these injustices. I'm not even going to shout out creators in my own circle that are a part of marginalized groups. It is amazing to see her denounce white privilege in one breath and uphold it in another. I literally was like 17 when I learned like the severity and the pain, how up that word is and every other racial story because I, I never learned it growing up I was never taught it my parents literally never expressed to me the severity of it I definitely had to learn it the hard way I'm almost happy that I learned it that way because if I would have just grown up kind of knowing it was bad and never had it said all around me and even like said it mouth rap songs that said it and all that kind of stuff I wouldn't have learned the hard way how bad it was I don't think I would be as adamant and as devoted as I am now to stopping everyone from saying it I don't really use the term white privilege because I feel like it has lost a lot of its initial meeting, but it is not limited to most white people feeling as if they can walk next to a police officer without fear or apprehension. It also encompasses a white person's ability to be ignorant to racial nuances, like allegedly not knowing that the n-word was bad. It can describe a white woman's gumption in publicly stating on her platform of millions that she did not know that it was a bad thing. It can describe a white woman saying she's scared of people who still use the n-word. There is a difference between sympathizing and acting as if you are the one that is the most hurt by such actions. Fucking tangents. I was making key points about this video. Number five is her audacity. Her audacity to point fingers at other influencers like PewDiePie who have gotten into scandals regarding their use of presidential language while downplaying her own scandals. Every single day on a daily basis, whether it's from people on the streets, whether it's kids, whether it's adults, or it's your favorite creators like PewDiePie who just had this giant scandal for saying it. And I'm not even like calling him out or hating on him. Like I, people have found videos of me saying that when I was like 13 but it's that PewDiePie has 50 million subscribers and he could do a lot with that. He could come on and definitely say, you know, that was wrong. And she is always sure to denote that she has had her own scandal with the N word, but it's okay though, because it wasn't that serious because of her age and her lack of understanding at the time. And I would normally agree to that, but when she keeps pointing it out, it gives me the sense that she does not understand how her past actions were wrong and why it was and still is very valid for people to question her about about those actions despite her age since she still sometimes shows how racially insensitive she can be. It also gives me the understanding that she has this deep-seated need to be the most ethical, most worthy influencer because she uses her platform for good guys. Just don't look at all the bad things. And the scandal continues. Idubs dropped his content hot video on Tana on February 6th of 2017, which was just a couple of weeks after Tana's The N-Word release. As previously stated, the footage of their encounter effectively dismantled Tana's overdramatized story, which led her to releasing another video on February 17, 2017, titled An Apology. She began by addressing her use of the N-word in her past. She had to readdress this because when Idubs' video dropped onto YouTube, those clips of her started to resurface again. And it is very interesting to see that she doesn't acknowledge that she claimed to not know what the word meant in a video that she only posted a month prior to everybody asking me this question. They're like, why would you say you thought it meant homie or friend if in the video you were saying it in a derogatory way? I said I thought it meant homie or friend because I was a f***ing idiot. I literally was like 17 when I learned like the severity and the pain, how f up that word is and every other racial story because I, I never learned it growing up. Instead, she intentionally focused only on the Snapchat she posted as her original response to the allegations. The first thing I want to talk about is the main thing, the thing that is everywhere, and that is videos of me saying the n-word and more importantly, the half-assed, disgusting, sh way 
that I apologized for them in the past. There are a few videos of me as a freshman in high school calling my best friend Amari, who is black, the N-word, and he's filming me. And while I've apologized for those before, I look back to my apologies in the past and I'm so ashamed of them. They are so half-ass and bad. I know that there's this one video of me where I literally come on Snapchat and say, hey, I know that there's videos of me saying the n-word. Well, Mac Miller says it and I thought it meant homie or friend. I'm sorry. We all grow. We all learn. I made a mistake. Bye. And here we go again with this thing of I'm going to be so real with you guys. And I'm sorry for giving you guys such a stupid apology and explanation because you mean so much more to me than that. You guys are worth so much more than that. And you guys are my family and I've always prided myself on being really real with you guys. I won't continue to drag out this controversy, but the one thing I want you guys to take away from this specific apology is that she continuously self-deprecates. It is consistent to the point of being distracting, and it is an aspect that she has maintained up until modern times. Years later in 2020, when Tana went on to the Call Her Daddy podcast, the host Alex called her out about her previously broken arrangement to come onto the podcast. And while addressing this criticism, Tana continuously speaks negatively about herself while apologizing for her sporadic absence. And I was like, oh, this is like really good. Yeah, like I can't wait to see her today. Like this is going to be great. Never showed up. We waited for hours. That's the difference between me now is like, I can't say I still wouldn't walk through the city of New York blackout drunk, but yeah. if I had an obligation, A, I would know about it. We have to get into it. I didn't even know what was happening. Like, right. And B, um, I would still show up like right. holy, holy fuck. Right. But I, we do need to get into like the logistics of this moment. Watching this video, even that, I was just like, like Tana, if you're going to be a idiot yeah like do a better job and then even it's like watching it now like I look back and I'm just like you you, you idiot fucking bitch. like I still feel that I'm I'm happy to not be that yeah now, but at the same time like just it, it's one of the biggest L's I think I've ever taken the problem with self-deprecation while apologizing to others is that it is typically used to inspire feelings of guilt in the person receiving the apology according to licensed mental health counselor William Barry although there may be truth in both the apology and in the self-deprecation often the goal is to bring about forgiveness or at least quell the ill feelings toward the offender right away this speaks to the manipulative undertones that have always existed in Tana's videos. But of course we want to give her grace when she was between the ages of like 17 and 19 because it was probably done a little bit unknowingly at that time. However, as we continue through her content, this pattern still very much exists, which is why I deem it as a credible and consistent attribute of the Tana Mojo persona. In September of 2020, Tana posted a long overdue apology to her YouTube channel and it did not go over very well. <laughs> the apology was ignited by former friend of Tana, former member of Trash and creator Colin Barry. In June of 2020, during the peak of Black Lives Matter, Colin published a video talking about his experiences with Tana. He began by addressing her past justifications of using the N-word with the hard R and stating that she believed she plainly lied about her reasoning for using it. You know, in my previous iDubs video, I stated that I did not and still do not believe iDubs to be a racist person. But I made it clear that sometimes labeling someone one word or another pales in comparison to the observable impact they have had. And Colin's video really made me think about that again. Something that was really fucked up about that situation though is that my comments were flooded with IDUB stands coming on there and basically saying say n-word, calling me a stupid n-word, and my DMs would be flooded with people saying that I look like a gorilla and just really racist shit that I'm not gonna lie. You know, I had dealt with racist experiences, obviously. I definitely had dealt with things in the past, but I'm not gonna lie. I had never dealt with it like that. That was really, really hurtful for me. Ian had a huge impact a horrible one. And I just feel like that needed to be restated here again. During the IDUB situation, Colin felt the fallout once Ian posted his content cop on Tana because he originally stood with her because he believed her version of the story until the true context was shown. Colin effectively cast a significant amount of doubt on her previous apologies for her racist actions as well. He also gave examples of her microaggressions towards him. So why are you going back and forth with me, arguing with me, basically saying that you can't be racist because your best friend's black and just doing all this extra stuff stuff when you literally apologize. 
So did you not mean the apology? Like, was that apology just for show then? And then you're literally still being microaggressive by making me seem angry and aggressive to you because of something that I have a right to be upset about. So you can't say that you've grown and that you changed when you're literally still being racist. Then he plainly states that he believes her intentions towards him were at least in some way racist or racially motivated. Tell these lies about me and make me seem like this villain like that's the thing like she literally was villainizing me and I can't help but feel that there was racist intent involved because all of this started because of me expressing my issues with the racist stuff that she had said in the past. Shortly after his posting in a show of solidarity, Simply Nessa published her piece called Dear Tana Mojo, which detailed her experiences with Tana that seemed to be racially charged as well. Notably, Nessa not only focused on Tana's mistreatment of her, but also Tana's manager's mistreatment of her. Something pretty significant that Nessa stated is in reference to Black people sometimes letting things go or giving people the benefit of the doubt rather than jumping to the conclusion that things had racial under or overtones. One of the times when Tana was staying with me, I ended up introducing her to Jordan Warona and he ended up citing her as a client literally on the spot. All of a sudden they were both being very distant with me. Things started, you know, changing. A lot of the deals that were being brought to me were all of a sudden like, oh, actually, never mind. And then I would notice Tana would get them and I'm like, hmm. Like, and I didn't want to believe that he was, you know, taking and stopping opportunities for me. But I did have a lot of, you know, friends on the outside and as well as family saying that Vanessa, realistically, he's probably going to drop you because he found a client that is very marketable. She is a white woman. Like, she's going to be very marketable. And I didn't want to believe that. I didn't want to think, oh, it was a race thing or a skin color thing. But I mean, in this industry, realistically, that is a factor. This is very important to stress because as much as people want to say that black and brown people constantly pull out the race card at every opportunity, it isn't true. Many people of color are more likely to let misbehaviors pass them by. They don't always want to actively call out white people where it is deserved because if they do, we run the risk of being called mean or aggressive. When a person of color refers to someone as a racist and it is clearly backed up by the person's actions, it is often met with so much doubt because people either don't want to believe it or because they are that apathetic. There are quite a few people who still refuse to say that Shane Dawson and Jeffree Star are racist or prejudiced even though there are so many years of evidence that are stacked up against them along with unchanged present behaviors. So this brings me to the question of what will it take for people to collectively agree that a public figure is indeed racist? With Tana, she has done the following. Refer to a black person as the N-word with the har R, but she was giving grace for that past action because it occurred when she was very young. Okay, but she also lied about that act and her understanding of the N-word several times after. She censored herself in a conversation where she allegedly wanted to draw attention to discrimination people of color face. In that same video, she profited from the experience that only would truly hurt black people. She spends much of her time in the presence of people who have long strings of racist behaviors. She has had two former personal friends, both of whom were black, come forward with their experiences about her. Both Nessa and Colin and put themselves up for public scrutiny by publishing their videos. Tana has a massive fan base, much larger than either of theirs. They had shit to lose and still went through with it anyways. I'm typically very conservative with the term racist when referring to public figures because we do not know the full extent of their ideologies and offline interactions. I am still very hesitant even with alluding to that term when it comes to Tana, but I would have a difficult time refuting someone who did. Tana has been given so much grace throughout her online career career due to her age and ignorance, but there comes a point where we must all acknowledge when enough is enough. The major turning point with Tana is people from her personal life, people who knew her offline outside of her persona coming forward with their own stories. We could choose not to believe Nessa and Colin, but when you compare Tana's past and present actions alongside their stories, it creates a much clearer image of Tana's shortcomings not only as a creator, but as an individual. She still has room and breath to grow and change, but we cannot demand people of color to stick around waiting for it to occur. Her first scandal with racism occurred in 2017 and her last time addressing related situations was in 2020 where she would have been 22 years old. 
The term racist is a very hard and inflammatory word. It is a stain in someone's social standing. But imagine how the groups of people impacted by their words and actions feel. I know there are some of you out there that would question why I seem to be more harsh and critical towards Tana than iDubs who screamed the most derogatory words possible back in the day. And that's a fair question. The reason is the manipulative nature of performative activism or to only publicly state your support of marginalized groups while actually existing in a manner that goes against those spoken beliefs, it is far more insidious and damaging than a generally open bigot. Not that I'm referring to iDubs as a bigot. Performative stances lack the humility and self-reflection to assess how you are contributing to injustices, whether intentionally or not, and what changes are required by you. While I have not done a complete deep dive into Idubs's career quite yet. I still hold that his actions in 2016-2017 were the product of ignorance and pride, while Tana's appears to be out of fear, a lack of self-awareness, and care. Also after the video dropped, Keemstar posted a video on Twitter where he basically was like, Tana, it's pretty obvious in this video you're not talking like yourself because she does talk like a robot in the whole video. That's because she's reading a script. He also says in that video, it's obvious you want to tell Colin and Nessa to f off. It's obvious you don't care. This is like verbatim what he said. <laughs> obvious you don't care about them, which he's not wrong. Like, that's correct. That is the vibe you got from the video. He goes, so you should just say that to them and you should just be Tana Mojo because you're losing relevancy. And Tana, who has had no time in the world to tweet to Colin or Nessa or any of the other people calling her out for racism, she did have time to address Keemstar. She did have time to <laughs> talk to him and she said, Keemstar, you're so bright. This is fantastic advice. So my question would be, if you think that's fantastic advice are you literally saying that this apology which you claimed was your last one which you claimed was the one where you were really taking full accountability and you really felt like you were wrong you are really saying that you should have just told Nessa and Colin to f off From makeup brushes, boozy beverages, and plagiarism, Tana has advertised for both bad and uncreative, unimaginative businesses, including her own. I'm going to lump all of her scams into one section because they all amalgamate under one question that I want to discuss. Why do people keep trusting this girl? <laughs> For brevity, we are going to categorize all of her scams that I'm aware of into two types. One, improper and slash or deceitful marketing, and two, exploitative, or has properties of exploitation. <laughs> now, if you have seen any videos about Tana or her past scams, you know that these categories will probably constantly intersect and intertwine, but I separated them as such because I believe each situation heavily illustrates the individual facet named. For each scam type, I'm going to give you guys a brief description of each event and then discuss why why it is or is not a scam and what it means in accordance with Tana's career. And I need to think of a commercial as soon as possible. Well, after researching the market for fragrances and their target audiences, I happened upon the census that was taken in 2018, which concluded that sweeter smells are easily marketed to a 12 to 16 year old female demographic. What's that smell? I'm glad you asked. It's actually a combination of my favorite notes. Are talk. you smoking weed? Actually, it's CBD. It heightens my awareness. I hate you people. What do you mean by- Her commercial reminds me of a Lele Pond sketch. <laughs> In January of 2020, Tana released a curated perfume called Tana by Tana, and it was immediately sold out. She was promptly scrutinized for selling the product for $48 after giving her audience an exposition about how she grew up poor and stole perfumes from stores. No, did I have a perfume, which is such a fucking weird thing to say. I've been working on this for like a fucking year. Let's talk a little bit about the scent and the perfume. I grew up poor as fuck. So I would always be stealing or trying to find money to buy very cheap perfume. And my favorite cheap perfumes were the quintessential like Target, Walgreens, Walmart, like French vanilla, like $5 a bottle, but like free when you steal it. When some fans received the product, they complained of the quality of the packaging and said it looked eerily familiar to products from Hot Topic and other mass produced materials. Next up, we have the Kinza Cosmetics ordeal, which is largely accredited to Gabby Hanna because of how poorly she addressed it. Kinza Cosmetics appears to be a company or website that attempts to mirror the appearance of other cosmetic brands in order to gain some credibility, but the company is in essence a reseller of wholesale goods and products. Meaning Kenza probably purchases cheaply made products in large quantities at low cost, which gives them the ability to resell the products at low prices and still turn a significant amount of profit. Tana promoted this business on her Instagram story specifically for makeup brushes that are allegedly originally priced at nearly $100 per set. And they are doing a promotion 
promotion right now where all of their makeup brushes are free. All you have to do is pay the shipping. I'm obsessed with so many of them and they're really high quality brushes and literally all you have to do is pay shipping. So swipe up to check them out. Shout out Kenza Cosmetics. When purchasers receive the advertised brushes, if they received the advertised brushes. They were obviously of low quality and people later found the same brush sets on sites like AliExpress. In 2021, Tana launched a lingerie brand called Tana Uncensored, which really could have been a big success in the long run because it works pretty well with her online persona since she often hypersexualizes herself. Once the brand was released, buyers caught on to the fact that the lingerie that Tana poured her heart and her soul into could be found on sites like Shein and AliExpress. <laughs> And again, the quality was low and didn't match the marked up prices. The last event of this section is the Dizzy Wine Venture, which was actually another good idea for Tana's platform, but alas. In 2021, Tana introduced her following to the concept of a fun drink that was young and edgy with a rebellious spirit. It was just a canned wine revolutionary, I know. And this was exposed to be another instance where she probably just repackaged an already made item and lent her name out to it. But you may or may not know that this past month I have been so busy working so hard and that's not a lie or an excuse on my baby. My baby, my baby, my baby, Dizzy Wine. This is from like a day ago, but there's some in it. Tana's manager revealed in an interview to Us Weekly that Tana used a company called Elix. He said, We tasted a lot of great grapes and looked at many different options when dialing in the taste for Dizzy. We finally found a great relationship with Elix, who hit it out of the park with our new company. So if you go on Elix website, they're literally a company where you can create your own canned wine. They have the same base flavor as Tana's wine, and all you have to do is upload whatever design or picture you want on the can. And with that, we will begin our discussion on the most obvious question. What makes these situations scam? A product was marketed and usually distributed out to the purchasers, so how could they be scams? These business ventures could be considered scams because of the deceit laced throughout the marketing campaigns. Tana always volunteered the information that she put so much time, effort, and love into these ventures but that is clearly not the case. These were not uniquely made products with the sole intention to have her audience share in something that she personally liked or designed. It isn't alarming or rare for an influencer to market a product with their names on it with their audience being fully aware that they are simply the face of that product rather than the creator or the designer. If Tana just wanted to lend her name out to a product without all the manipulative fanfare, that would have been fine. Each venture, aside from the Kids and Cosmetics situation, which was just a promotion, but each business venture of Tana's lacked longevity. Only Dizzy Wine still has an active webpage, though the products are currently sold out. While I do understand when a startup just doesn't work out or if it's not as profitable as originally planned, I'm not sure if that's the case for Tana between Tana by Tana, Dizzy Wine, and Tana Uncensored. It looks like these businesses were set up with the sole attention of starting up, selling out a large batch of product, and closing up shop right after. In 2019, Tana promoted a website called Eddie Bird, which advertised as a company that authored essays for those who are willing to pay. Yes, it is plagiarism, and yes, YouTube, amongst other social media platforms, banned creators from promoting such services. The dissenting opinions for this issue came in very swiftly, rightfully critiquing Tana for advertising plagiarism to her very impressionable audience. But what is very interesting here is that Tana seems to have blamed her manager, Jordan, for this event. And this is notable because Tana promoted Eddie Bird at least three different times in 2017, 2018, and 2018 is when they were banned from most social media platforms, and again in 2019. During the pandemic, Tana and her management created a charity called Project 1111 with the intent purpose to donate the proceeds to those who are impacted by the coronavirus in any way. According to a screen grab available on the Wayback Machine from November of 2020, the website stated, by utilizing Tana's massive audience of over 20 million followers, all platforms combined, and Jordan's powerful talent roster, 1111 is building to reach the masses. On the screenshot, which is the most recent one available, almost $90,000 was raised with the bulk of it coming from Tana's merch sales, along with a personal donation from her. It was later shown that the the money given to Project 1111 was funneled into other charities like Pandemic of Love. In the world of celebrity charities, the 
this really isn't an uncommon practice or inherently a scam. Celebrity charities garner more attention than the normal ones because the person's name is attached to it. People are more willing to donate directly to a person they know and love. I would say that it was questionable to use Tana as the face for Project 1111 since feelings of trust are not typically garnished from her name, but people still always fund whatever idea she throws out into the atmosphere. Someone's selling out all of her products. Tana did later address the skepticism. Everything was done through a reputable company. So it's like if people were going to come to me about a bunch of scandalous things like regarding my charity, I would just be like, yo, I'm doing it with Pandemic of Love, who's been doing this far longer than with me. Like, you know what I mean? So it's just like, that's where you go to fill out the form. Every single dollar that is donated is going to people to help. And I have all of the proof of that. We literally just did a crazy thing with like Cult for Good. You can ask Elijah where we like sponsored helping people in Vegas. And that was like so fun and awesome. And I've just seen how many people the 1111 Project has already helped. And if you think I'm doing it for any other reason than to literally help people, you are so dumb. The amount of money you make from a charity tax write-off is like one one thousandth of what I would make in like a half a day's merch sales. Since late 2020, there has been no activity on the Project 1111 Instagram page and the website seems to be left inactive. In April of 2021, Tana launched Tana's Angel Agency in conjunction with the Unruly Agency. It was meant to be a management division that gave advice to people on how to effectively build a brand on platforms like OnlyFans. It gave me pretty strong vibes of Ninja's masterclass that Drew Guten reviewed. <laughs> this agency followed the success of her own OnlyFans pages, Tana Tana Uncensored and Tana Gone Wild. She was again very quickly criticized for being unqualified to run such an endeavor, especially for sex workers or for people interested in sex work since her success on OnlyFans came from her built-in audience on YouTube, a platform she has been building for years. We also saw some criticism of her fan base being younger being brought up again, and this time it is a little bit more intricate than simply being seen as a role model. Now I have no problem with sex work. I may have even dabbled in it myself, but I still would not encourage teenagers between the ages of 16 and 19 to go into it without fully understanding all that could possibly go wrong with it and how it could impact their futures and future career choices. I may not agree with the stigma that surrounds sex work, but it would be very unfair of me or anyone to advertise it as if it is a mainstream career path that many people respect. It is not quick or easy money. It requires sacrifice for some and success is not always achieved equally or fairly. The Angel Agency was just yet another soulless project to paint Tana's as a business mogul because it does not appear to be in operation anymore. And on the Wayback Machine, I'm unable to find captures of a working website in most of 2022. I labeled these three occurrences as exploitative because they are all centered around the idea of helping or bettering someone but with little thought and little regard given to the person in question. And they were all constructed with a self-serving goal at the forefront either to gain great social standing via good publicity or for that green stuff. <laughs> Project 1111 is a bit of an outstanding situation because we have to balance the harm and the good done here. Tana and her team was able to donate at least $90,000 to those in need. Tana was used as a fixture for advertising purposes, yes, but the good done is still undeniable. However, we also need to acknowledge that the decision to make Tana the face of this project was probably in part a way to circumvent the backlash towards her. I know that so many people believe that just because something had ill intentions or ill will does not negate the good deed achieved. And this is partially true, but we have to also understand that it does not absolve a person from their wrongdoings, nor should it alleviate them from criticism. Tana does not get to pretend like people were coming at her for no reason. She has proven time and time again to be an untrustworthy public figure who seems to only care about validation and a check. It was appropriate and understandable for people to side-eye her in this instance. As for Eddie Bird, not only was she attempting to profit from her young and short-sighted fan base, she tried to pawn off the responsibility onto her management. Tana and her management are one and the same to the public, as it is with all creators and celebrities. In other words, we don't give a flying fuck if she was the one who posted it or if Jordan posted it. The account says Tana Mojo, so we're going to look at her for answers, not Jordan and certainly not her shady management company. But if we want to discuss her management company, the one that greenlit the extension of the Angel Agency from the Unruly Agency, we can discuss how careless they are, how flippant they are, and how they are obviously in the business of quick fame and cash grabs for as long as the influencer can bring in dollars. These scams 
DMs meant nothing to Unruly or to Tana. The fair criticism and skepticism meant nothing to them. For Tana, it is business as usual. For Tana, people were and are simply being dramatic. For Tana, when influencers are called out for deceitful behaviors, she believes that they should remain unbothered. I aspire to be this level of unbothered. Worldwide mascara gate scandal, 50.2 million views. And the bitch came back, no apology, didn't address it, and is reviewing a Huda Beauty setting powder. Come on, that's gold. I will never be apologizing or addressing anything again. Amidst her scandals and scams, people still trust Tana. People still love Tana, no matter what she does or says. Why? Why do people continuously trust influencers who have had a pattern of lying, a pattern of deceiving behaviors, a pattern of showing that they do not care about their influence or the products that they advertise to their audiences? Well, those reasons were really speckled in throughout this entire long ass video. <laughs> But to sum it all up, first things first, her fame has always been perpetuated by others. Gabby Hanna, Cody Ko, James Charles, Shane Dawson, David Dobrik. And in the last few years, mainstream celebrities like Paris Hilton and Bella Thorne have also decided to give her the time of day. They all give her more credibility by collaborating with her and constantly uplifting her. Tana built her platform in such a way that consistently made people feel like they were her friends. How many times have we seen Tana tell her audience how much she loves and admires them. How many times have we seen Tana endlessly think and praise her audience? Tana is not like Blair White who makes herself into a martyr whenever controversy comes to her doorstep. Tana tries to appear as if she is taking ownership for whatever situation she has found herself in, or at least she used to. Similar to Logan Paul during his discourse with filming the deceased, Tana allowed people to collectively dump on her and she seemed to take it like a good sport. When she apologizes, she tries to present as self-aware. She self-deprecates, she talks down about herself. She makes people aware that she is aware of what so many think about her. This action can make people want to fight for her, to defend her. To some extent, she has lowered the expectations of many, but not in the way that I've seen other commenters say. I'm not talking about in the manner that she has lowered expectations so that when she does something wrong, people just say, Oh, that's just Tana. She's just a mess. She has lowered expectations in a way that made people think, this dumb blonde bitch. The way Tana wields the dumb blonde stereotype is maddening. When Tana does something that is even remotely good, like Project 1111, the amount of praise and accolades thrown her way is immense. Yet there are creators who fundraise not because they feel guilty, not because they needed good PR. They did it because they wanted to, because they truly wanted to help. But when controversial Blondie does something with clearly not so great intentions, people go out of their minds. When Tana does something bad, unethical or just plain stupid. The reaction is, it wasn't that big of a deal. It's just makeup brushes. It's just wine. There's always debate about what a scam technically is. Technically, Tana promoted Kenza Cosmetics, who was always shady as hell, but people still got their brushes, so how was it a scam? What other creators would get that kind of grace, that kind of leniency? Not many. Miss Mojo forged a deep connection with her fan base and grew with them. And notice that I said grew with, not grew up. She didn't grow up, not really not online. She just openly does more adult behaviors like drinking or smoking or fucking. Tana's audience grew from kids to teenagers to young adults and Tana is still Tana. Tana, to me, when I see her, is still the girl sitting in her bedroom telling tall tales about hairdressers, rumors, and boys. The Tana I see today is the product of a teenager relying too heavily on public validation and public opinion. She has been willing to lie and deceive to reach the amount of success or notoriety that she has today. I didn't say anything about the Jake Paul relationship publicity son earlier, but I'm gonna talk about it right now. The relationship was farcical, yes, but to be willing to marry or rather fake marry somebody for their audience to see and pay for, 
that action speaks volumes. I don't have deep feelings about the sanctity of marriage, but is it not telling for someone who claims to be so real to do something so fake? Is money and fame worth so much that they were willing to look like absolute fools with no standards? It is curious to see someone pride themselves on authenticity, though I've never personally bought into the foolhardy thought that Tana was ever authentic, but she did build her platform on that notion and now it's completely gone. Online today, she looks like a shell of a person. She is exactly what her agency desired her to be. A token controversial influencer with no integrity and nothing to lose that is willing to do whatever it takes to stay relevant, validated, wealthy, and famous. And I hope it was worth it. Tana Mojo is by far the most unserious, serious creator that I have ever seen. <laughs> I can see why certain demographics of people gravitate towards her. She could be fun, witty, and a bright spot on a platform that can sometimes be very dominated by uh, dark themes themes. But what I can't understand is why people take her seriously. And I believe that is a popular sentiment, which simultaneously leads people to not taking her scams, scandals, and dramas seriously. What does Tana have to do to drive away her audience? She has lied time and time again. She has scammed. She has misled. She has duped. <laughs> her original audience has such strong parasocial connections to her that I truly believe the only way for those ties to be severed is for them to to naturally outgrow Tana. And that happens at different times for everyone. But even so, as new social media platforms continue to emerge like TikTok, the less likely we will ever see Tana disappear into the void because she can constantly garnish a new audience, a new fan base to exploit. And if there's one thing I know that Miss Mojo can do very well, it's capturing the attention of others. The reason I named this video The Rise of Tana Mojo is because her career is far from over. She will continue to morph and shapeshift when and where needed. She clearly has a strong desire to become something akin to the early 2000s socialites like Paris Hilton, and I say she is well on her way at this point. I know I did not cover her MTV series or TanaCon. I plan to cover both of those in separate videos as retrospectives because if I didn't, if I had to merge it all into this one video, it'd be too much. I hope you guys have enjoyed this deep dive into Tana's career. I hope I offered some fresh perspectives and insights. Remember to like and subscribe because I have more analysis and deep dives on the way. Until next time, bye.